Well, hello, boys and girls. This is when I feel like at o'clock. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom, as you already know. Everybody in the land does. Talking about everybody in the land knowing people, we have two fine guests here today. Uh, John from Off the Wall Hockey. Everybody knows that. Welcome, John. Hey, John. thanks for having me on. Uh, no problems. I always have you on. And Joe, everybody knows Joe from B Pal Picks, from uh, Flyers Nitty Gritty, from. Uh, his uh, sports fanatic, sport fanatic news. Everybody knows him as well. These guys are freaking awesome. That's why we I, I I drag them on to my videos every time I possibly can, and they uh, they usually put up some resistance, but show up eventually. And uh, we've been doing a series on every team and how they did in the off season, uh, where especially in free agency, and where we see them going based on that on some of the moves they made and how they made them and maybe some of the things they did last year, get into a little bit of drafting possibly. Uh, we have been going in parallel alphabetical order, which means that it is sort of alphabetical order-ish. Uh, we <laughs> we did, uh, what did we do together last time? Did we do Calgary? No, we didn't do Calgary. What did we do together? We don't even remember. <laughs> we the Avalanche. Did we do Calgary? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, we did Colorado, yeah. right? Yeah, you can go check that out on my channel. And on uh, uh, it's, John did a really cool one on Hoffman and some five teams that he may end up going to, which I did a little bit earlier, and it was fun to watch now compared to what I thought before and see uh, how he did it. It was great. And uh, so anyways, we got to get into LA Kings. LA Kings to me is like the most – one of the most interesting teams right now, mostly because of how well they did at the end of the season last year um, and, uh, like, how good their goaltending looked. I don't know. They looked like a team that was going to take on the world, and then all of a sudden COVID came in. Like, they were pushing for a playoff spot. So looking on paper and everything and what you saw from last year, I'm going to start with Joe here because you write – for the LA Kings as well, right, Joe? For the one site I do, yes. Um, I I would say you got to push. I think it was probably a year in advance to where you're really looking at with some of your guys. Like Bjornford's only 19. Uh, Turcotte's probably a year or so out from really making a uh, impact on the team. Uh and then you got a guy like Anderson as a fourth rounder coming up this year. You have Kale Clegg probably actually make a bigger impact. But you're waiting for guys like Bjorn Furk to come in. You're waiting for guys like Byfield, obviously, Kaliev, um, Tyler Madden, like we talked about before the video. Anderson Dolan's definitely going to play this year. Um, so, and then obviously also another guy, um, Sean Dersey. And so, I mean, there's a lot of guys – as we talked about before the video, that Rob Blake did a good job acquiring from other organizations as solid prospects as well to bring in a good younger developing core here. But because those guys are just in their first years this year, if they get called up this year, unless if they get that young energy that makes them go on a run like they got last year, they're probably still looking at about a year out. But there is something to be said about when a bunch of young guys get called up at the same time. And then you just kind of go off of that no nervousness because they don't even know what's going on after a couple games. They're kind of just going out there playing, just going a million miles a minute and just like always happy just because they're in the league type deal. There is something about that type of energy, but that has to propel you over some of these teams that did make big signings and all that, so on and so forth. That's why it will be interesting to see if because there's still some good guys sitting on the market, the Kings use if they want to try to make the playoffs this year, their $13 million to try to bring guys in for one year to then expedite it and then just have the younger guys be around more veterans rather than a couple veterans and then a bunch of young guys. So that's why it will be interesting because you have $13 million. I mean, heck, uh, 
Vodnin's a defenseman that wants to get paid. He can't seem to find a contract. L.A. is really good with defensemen. If he goes to L.A. for one year and really produces, there, he, there you go. He'll get his contract that he wants. So that could be even a one-year uh, option there. So there's a couple guys that I see on the market. If they want to make it this year, they could try to bring in for one year. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good point. Talking about defensemen, John, uh, they took – uh, they did something interesting bringing in Ole Mata from Chicago. Uh, I can't remember. I don't think they gave up too much for him or anything like that. But um, what do you think about that acquisition? And also, what, uh, uh, like what we were talking about, do you think they can carry over their success from last year? Or, or do you think it was just kind of a one-off? Uh, well, to start with with Ole Mata, um, I think LA, LA, that's an interesting move for them. It's kind of a pressure off move for where you know, expectations aren't high for the LA Kings. Most people see them still a couple of years away from really starting to make that big push. Um, so this is a chance for Ole Mata, who has struggled with, struggled with injuries throughout his career and has not had a last or a good last couple of seasons. The last couple of years have been really tough for Mata. This is kind of a chance to just reset and, and start somewhere completely fresh. And he wasn't very good in Chicago. He wasn't good in his last year in Pittsburgh. Um, it, it almost. It almost feels kind of like a last chance for for Mata, like a lot of a lot like what Galchenyuk's getting um, this this coming season, where these guys have kind of gone team to team and just can't seem to put it all together. Um, Mata, I think, is in kind of a similar situation where he he had some really solid years with the Penguins, and then it went downhill. Then he went to Chicago, and it didn't get any better. So now he's to L.A. And he kind of has like one last chance to prove that he can he can be that you know top four guy that he was supposed to be. Um, and the Kings do well with defensemen. That this is a good place for Olimata. They do well with defense, and uh, you know whether it's coaching or probably a combination of a lot of different things. Their system, they they tend to do well with defensemen and get more out of defensemen than most teams would be able to. We see guys like. Um, like Sean Walker and, um, you know, a guy like, you know, Curtis McDermott or Michael Anderson or some of these, some of these guys that, you know, Derek Forbert, who's not there anymore, was a guy that kind of got, you know, his career built up in LA and then he ended up moving on. Um, they, they do well with these, these guys that aren't exactly household names, but they turn them into very solid defensemen. So it's going to be interesting to see um, if they can do that with Ole Mata and kind of save his career. And for the team overall, uh, I think last year they, they got very hot at the end of the season. I think a lot of that was the pressure was kind of off at that point. You're in the you know bottom three of the division. You're probably not going to make the playoffs. You know you're not passing teams like Vegas and Edmonton and Vancouver and even Calgary. You weren't going to pass those teams to make it into a playoff spot most likely. So it was a lot of young guys just kind of with that pressure off and just going out there and playing the game. And looking ahead to this year, I still I, I see a team that's probably a couple years away. Um, but what I will say is they have one of the best prospect pools of young players of any team in the league. And I think if you're an L.A. Kings fan, that's something to be really, really excited about. And just exercise a little bit of patience here. Te fans never like their teams to go through rebuilds and never like their teams to have to be lousy for a few years before they can be good again. But looking at this from a realistic standpoint if if the kings are just patient and let this develop for the next couple of years we could be looking at a team with an extremely bright future and a lot of the best young talent in the league coming up yeah yeah for sure i mean getting byfield uh i have visions of byfield and velarde on one line if they happen to play velarde on the wing mm -hmm. like those guys are enormous beasts let's face it like uh i don't think there's anything in the league that can compare to that that kind type of duo yeah i wouldn't there's say great so duos so fine. Yeah. There, there, there's great duos but i don't know if there's anything like that kind of duo that is uh um they can beat you up and score and they're huge it's uh i don't think we've seen that in a very long time for sure LA they also got both a, have good strides for skating they're not yeah. skating sna like snails on the ice for as yeah. big
have good strides in terms of skating. Yeah, even mm -hmm. if they play, even if they play them up the middle, two the two big centers like that, and uh, like you mentioned with Bjornfist, and you have Kopitar still. Kopitar center, yeah, it's crazy, crazy. So, um, well, that also I think it was a really good point about things were uh, not so much pressure on them at the end there, but I think that goes a lot to the competitiveness of this team as well too, which bodes well for their future. Is mm -hmm. they, they didn't just like pack it in and say, okay, we're going to take our high pick and move on. Uh, LA, they gave her right, at, right to the very end. Yeah. Uh, there. I think you have a lot of young players there trying to prove themselves and say like, I'm an NHL level player and I'm going to be a good NHL player. And when you have that, those hungry young guys coming up and a lot of them coming up with this team, it, it that's a good recipe for a team that could potentially overachieve because they have so much, so many young guys who aren't proven and aren't experienced yet, but they have that drive and that hunger to play at their absolute best all the time, whether the team's winning or losing. And, and that certainly bodes well for their competitiveness going forward. And I think that could end up, we could see them being better, a little bit better than expected because they have that kind of attitude. Yeah, it seems like yeah. they picked those kind of players. Awesome. I was going to say, Joe, you, you're you like the goaltender's aficionado there. What do you see in Peterson that makes that, that made Peter, makes Peterson good so good right now? Um, I mean, I think what I said about Turcotte really applies to goaltenders the most. Having a, a guy, especially from college, like John said, you want to let them kind of age like a fine wine. You don't want to be like, okay, kid, we need you up right now at like mm -hmm. 22 years old because that's just going to screw their entire developmental trajectory. So they allowed him to do that. Even when Quick started to struggle, the Kings didn't go into panic mode and say, okay, now we need to rush this kid up. They let him get his cup of coffees. And so they, they did it well, and I think that's what – has put him in the situation now. He's worked with the minor league goalie coaches very much, and now he's worked and complimented a lot the uh, NHL-level goalie coaches. So uh, he's just a very found goaltender. He's very good in positioning. He's a guy that just seems to anticipate the play before it always types that kind of happens type of goalie, which is not really unexpected because I don't know what it is with um, some of these um, – like just smaller agile goalies he's of course a 6-1 guy i think in the mid 180s so i mean his like getting side to side on some saves like when you would watch him you'd be like yeah i don't know how in god's creation he saved that um yeah. that's why like he reminds you a bit that's why i think they're so high on him because that was quick as a youngster uh, uh when you're like i don't know how he got to that end of the post um so that's why I think the Kings aren't panicking also with Quick's contract because they know him and Pedersen are getting along. So it's not, yes, you're paying him a lot, but you did make your cap situation, even with, like John said, paying three guys that are not even there anymore, plus Quick, the amount you're paying him, over $13 million available. So you're not in an issue spot at all. Mm -hmm. So. They have a good goalie room. I think all that put together really makes him into the goalie he is. And I think this is the year. Uh, I wrote an article about it a while ago. I think this is the year to take the reins off of him and kind of let him take the job and let Quick take the step back and become the B. Mm -hmm. Let Peterson be the A and let Quick be the B. Excellent. And then, yeah. and then go from there because you're going to win more games if you want to have that run. That's fried by thrived by young energy. Excuse me. That would probably that would be with Peterson and Ned at this point of his career, most likely than Jonathan Quick. Quick would have to really turn back the clock in order to um, propel them to a run. Yeah. But, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with John on this one um, because John, if you don't know, if you haven't seen it, he does like these killer lines where he does play by play, <laughs> and. He, he watches, like, every kind of game. And, and from that perspective, you really got to be watching the game closely. So, um, and know all the names of the players. And, and you get you get to really be careful, get to uh, have a good view into each player and how they play. Mm -hmm. Ayafalo and Kempe, they've been grooming these guys for quite a long time on the wings there. Very important to the future of this lineup, possibly. 
Do you think these are guys that they'll be holding on to? Do you think there's more upside with those two? I, I don't know. Kempe plays in center as well, I do, I believe. But um, do you think there's more upside to those guys? Or do you think now at this place they're kind of fillers, hoping that they get some guys to replace them? Uh, I'm very high on Adrian Kempe. He's only 24, and he can play center or wing, which, again, I love that versatility in a player who can play you know, on the wing or down the middle. And Kempe, I really, really like a lot what I've seen from him. He had 32 points last season. He had 28 the year before. Um, go back to 17, 18, he had 37 points, which is his career high, and that was the last year that the Kings were a playoff team. Um, so obviously he was playing on a much better team back then when he got his career high in points, but I think he absolutely can be, you know, a 20 goal scorer and certainly a 40 point guy in his career. I don't really see him necessarily as like a top line guy, but I think kind of a mid lineup, you know, third or, or second or third line left winger, um, or you could move him into the middle. I like him a little bit better on the wing. Um, especially now with the center depth that, that they're going to have after drafting Byfield and having Turcotte come up and um, they got Tyler Madden in the pipeline as well. I think the Kings are pretty deep down the middle. Um, I'd like to see Kempe probably play the wing and I think he could be a really solid guy. I have follow. Um, he's good. He's, you know, fairly, fairly good as well. Uh, I guess I'm not, I don't know if I'm not as high on him, but he had 43 points last year, which was his career high. He had 17 goals, which uh, is a really nice year, um, especially on a team that didn't score a whole lot like the Kings. Having 17 goals is good. Another guy who I think is a winger, and I feel like they'll probably only, only long-term keep one of them, uh, maybe not both, especially with some of the young guys that they have coming up. Um, there's probably not going to be a roster spot for both of them, um, but... Yeah, I think they're both solid players. Aya follows a UFA after this coming season, and I think that might be his ticket out of there. And then they keep they have Kempe for another couple of years, and then he's an RFA again after that. So they can't just lose him as easily as they can lose Aya follow. Um, so I feel like Kempe is the most likely one to kind of stick around. But they're both solid players who have unfortunately been stuck on not so good teams for the past couple of years, but they, I, I like both of them. I think I follow if he can, if he can get leaving free agency and end up on a team where, you know, he's going to be probably like a, a mid lineup winger. And if he has good talent around him, we could really see explode as far as his play somewhere else. Um, but as uh, you know, Kempe is a guy that I think that they would probably keep around. He's he's really solid. I agree with John on that. I think uh, it makes more sense too because you got uh, the control years. You got two years, and then he's an RFA for. Kempe. And he's younger as well. Yeah. And I have followed though. I mean, hats off to the kid. He's undrafted. He's doing. He keeps getting better and better each year. So keep doing your thing. Yeah. I've, I think he'll probably go somewhere else, like John said, and probably continue to uh, produce um, on a bigger level, higher up in a line somewhere else. Because you're going to – a lot of these guys that are solid uh, lower line guys, even like the Lazadis of the world who they like as a center to be a third line winger slash center, but they don't, they're not going to need him in a year or two. So they, they're probably like, – there's a lot of guys the Kings are eventually going to – move for other assets just due to um bigger prospects coming up the pipe from the market yes. so that's just that's just a sign of a very good uh, organization in terms of structure so when you have problems and your biggest problem is well we don't have enough room for all these good talented people so that's when you know you have a good organizational uh, structure being built yeah, if they're not in it at the deadline, you could they could probably get a pretty decent pick from him. Uh, everybody Brian wants Follow, a little bit yeah, of extra. Yeah, yeah. Every, everybody wants a little extra scoring in their lineup. Come getting close to playoff time. Absolutely. Uh, you, you also mentioned something that I really uh, uh, that means a lot to me, only because it uh, makes me look good. <laughs> 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 McClellan, when he was in Edmonton, got a lot of flack in Edmonton for a lot of the things that were happening and how poor that team was. And 
Um, I all along was saying this isn't McClellan, this isn't McClellan, this isn't McClellan. I don't think it was a coaching problem at all. And uh, uh, I, I didn't get from very good people. David Staples, love the guy, beautiful guy, a great writer here. He, him and I got in it a little bit about that. He was like vehement it that it was coaching McClellan, coaching well and all that stuff like that. But after I saw what I what he did in San Jose, I just couldn't put the he just became a bad coach all of a sudden. Yeah. And now he goes to LA. What do you guys think about his work in LA? I I'm kind of leading you into this so far. The so far <laughs> since they've hired him because it was a hire where a lot of people went, what? What do you got? I'll start with uh, John on this one. Yeah, I, I, it's. He certainly hasn't done a bad job. I think, you know, he, he's it's it's weird seeing Todd McClellan kind of coaching a rebuilding team uh, because, for you know, for San Jose, they were they were a playoff contender at year after year after year with him. So it, it's interesting to see him in this situation because you don't see him coaching losing teams very often. But um, he I certainly think that he's doing a, a good job with the group that he has of just getting getting what he can out of this team. And you look at their lineup, um, I, you, you're not seeing big names here. Obviously, they've got Kopitar up front and Dowdy on the back end. But other than that, you don't have you know star players really here right now. Jeff Carter, well pre past his prime. Dustin Brown, not the player that he used to be, not even close. And after that, in, you, you've got guys like Ayafalo and Kempe and Velarde, Trevor Moore, Martin Furk is probably playing on your second line right wing right now. Like um, on the back end, you're, you've got defensemen like Sean Walker and Curtis McDermott playing back there. Like these aren't household names. He doesn't have a star team to star studded team to work with. And we saw what they were able to do at the end of the year last year and go on that run. And I just think it's about patience and I think it's about more about development than trying to win on a night in and night out basis. I mean, if you're the LA Kings right now, you're not so much worried about the win loss column as you're worried about these young guys developing into the players that you want them to turn into. And, and then you worry about the win loss column in two years from now, when you're making that push from going out of rebuild mode, playoff level mode, like we're seeing the New York Rangers do right now. Um, and I think I think McClellan's doing a, a solid job with it. He's certainly getting enough out of his guys, and and it's just it's weird seeing him in this situation where after being so good with the Sharks for so long, he's now kind of in a rebuild here. But um, I, I he's certainly not doing a bad job. It's not like he's hindering the rebuild in any way or anything like that. How about you, Joe? What do you think about how he's done there? Um, I think a big part of his coaching pulling the most out of what he has is a big reason other than the fact that when you get the pressure off of you, most uh, teams that are rebuilding do tend to play up at that moment. But I think the coaching did have a big part to do with the uh, end of season uh, rush there as well, where I think that's why the Kings believe they might be um, able to expedite the rebuilding process more than most outsiders feel because they feel they have the great foundations in place from Blake to McClellan and they're getting very good. Obviously they have a very good scouting department. We already said they have one of the best, if not the best uh, minor league pool. So, I mean, they, they had created a great foundation and that makes you comfortable. That's why I said at the forefront of the video, I think with that money, there's guys that'll take one year deals like Hamannick's, uh, Dylan's um, of the world. I don't think they'll bring back Ben Hutton, but he's 27. If you want to try to do that, you could do that. Uh, like there's guys that are veterans that you could bring in just for one year to help your young guys. And that doesn't hurt your rebuild at all when you get, get guys for one year contracts. That's what I feel they're still going to do. I think, honestly, they're just waiting for the market to be the cheapest because these guys keep not being able to find the deals they want. And as you continue to not find the deals you want, your price drops. So I think they're literally just waiting to find a couple veterans when their price is at exactly where they want to sign them. But Yeah. 
We yeah, um, I, I agree that's definitely possible. They're probably I think Ellie, if I remember correctly, is very good at giving people pl- uh, uh, tryout contracts and then making mm-hmm. the team as well. So you could be doing something like that as well. Um, I was going to get into Blake, but we're getting a little long here. But we already talked about it in our last one, and I'll bring it up again because it was really fantastic. Colorado Avalanche one we did, and we gloated a lot about Joe Sackett. But I'm going to gloat a lot about Blake because I think he's doing a fantastic job. And you've got uh, – he took over for Lombardi, who was a very experienced guy. And uh, um, he was new. He was – he hadn't had any really much experience. But he seems to have just – um, really trusted his people quite a bit, allowed them to be who they are. And uh, I, I don't know how much he's done with their uh, drafting and development team, but it seems like it, it's improving every year with uh, Blake and them involved there. I like how he's made this team into what he is. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, LA is a pretty fun team to talk about. And uh, you guys did a fantastic job of it. I got more things to think about that I didn't think about before. I hope you all are do- have that too. And we'll be back at this fine programming again. We're going to have uh, Steel from Steel, www.steelflyers. Check that out, you guys. You're going to want to check that out. We're going to be doing the Columbus Blue Jackets next. And uh, that will probably be with uh, Joe, because Joe likes to tag along quite a bit. He likes to just prop us up and make us look good. So uh, we we will probably be with Joe. And uh, we'll be seeing John again, because I'll probably be doing some on his channel again sometime in the future. I can imagine that. Maybe Joe will be there too. Uh, we got a couple other guys. Uh, Peyton I'm starting to bring on to a bunch. One one of these days we're going to have to do the big old loving live all together. (laughs) That'll be good times. So thanks for checking this out, guys. Thanks for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe to everybody's channel here. I'll remember it in the description, everybody's channel. And have a great day. Lots of love to you.